But I appreciate y'all having me here today. I appreciate having this opportunity. And what's really exciting is when you are thinking about the topic or the content that you want to present at these lectures, uh, you want it to be something maybe a little different. You want it to be something meaningful, or at least that's what I want. And this particular topic, um, for those of you who have been uh, attending any of the, the webinars that are offered through any of the organizations or even attending conferences, this may seem a little bit redundant, and that's okay, because right now we are in a phase of sleep technology where we, we want to keep talking about the future. But what I'm going to do is start with the past with my presentation, and then go to the future. And as you heard, um, education being my passion, it was really interesting. Each one of the speakers today, um, I really was able to take away something and just to hear them kind of reiterate and reinforce where we are. And I will not be talking about gray hair in here today. Uh, Y'all <laughs> heard I'm a, I'm a 20 plus year veteran myself. Um, I believe in the box. I'm not going to lie about it. But what I like to talk to, there you go. What I like to talk about is the generation of sleep. And I noticed it um, last year with this particular conference, you know, the people that show up. I, I don't know if the newer generation of sleep technologists have the opportunity to attend conferences. You know, y'all, we come from an era where it would be sponsored by our organization or the hospital, right? A lot of affirmative nods there. And, uh, you know, this generation, it, it, those funds are not necessarily there. One of the things I recommend is you build that into your um, employment negotiations, right? There's an opportunity for that. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm here for. So with this, and I also, I did hear the term death by PowerPoint today. <sighs> I'm just giving you a lot of information. I will not be reading things verbatim, but I, I like to give people information. And what you do with it, once you get it, is your business. I just wanted to make sure you had um, just some things to enjoy. So again, we're talking about the role of sleep technologists in advancing sleep medicine. I don't have any conflicts of interest. Uh, I currently work with MedBridge Healthcare as their um, director of accreditation, because accreditation is my background. I've worked for ACHC for, I worked for them for five years. And this is a large organization that has many, many sleep labs that undergo the accreditation through AASM, ACHC, and the Joint Commission. Those sleep labs are still out there, so. Um, but moving into education, as Candy mentioned, um, and it will be something we'll talk about later, but I am starting a polysomnography program at uh, Fayetteville Technical Community College. It is the third largest community college in North Carolina. Uh, I previously taught at another community college, same thing, polysom, and that really is what I realized I love. I love to do, educating and trying to get a new generation of techs, good techs, with all of the information that's coming out, you know, hopefully being able to touch on that. So what we're going to do today, we're going to explore the evolution of sleep technology. Um, how many of you are not just sleep, but also respiratory? Anybody in here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, ha I threw a couple of nuggets in there for you. I'm not respiratory, um, but we learn what we have to for sleep, and we try to teach that. We're going to understand the responsibility of sleep technologists. Now, again, we all know what our responsibilities are. But as I was going through this, and really once you put things to paper that's not a resume, it's really something that we need to just keep reminding ourselves and and promoting about ourselves this is everything that we do and there's there's nice new language for that there's exciting new language for what we do as sleep techs we're going to examine technological advancements in sleep medicine so you know y'all the future is now we're living it we are the generation <laughs> we're the generation that got scared to death by home sleep testing it's going to take our jobs mmm I know, I know, I get it. And lo and behold, here we are still sleep teching, right? We're still sleep teching. And uh, the one gentleman said something interesting about the um, home sleep test today. And I, I find it interesting with the scoring changes. I personally, and this is just my personal opinion, would love to see the HSATs really being used just as a screening that it was intended. Oh, I got the amen corner over here. I love it. I would love it to get back to being the screening tool rather than the diagnostic tool to implement treatment and re-engage patients with the patient caregivers who are the sleep technologists. So thank y'all. I didn't even pay them. They're not sponsored or anything. 
And then we'll get to discussing the future of sleep technologists in the field. So that's what we're trying to hit on today. All right, so we're going to start with the past, right? So how many of you recognize the name Nathaniel Kleitman? Dr. Kleitman, yeah, there we go, there we go. All right, so this is who, you know, I know some think of Dr. Dement as the father of sleep, and we'll get to him, but he really is the father of sleep research, and he made the uh, significant contributions to the field in understanding sleep patterns. And he's the one that got us to understand what REM is, circadian rhythm cycles, and laid that foundation for modern sleep medicine. And y'all, he did that somewhere between 1895 and before 1999. Now, show of hands, who in the room has been in sleep since before 1999. Yeah, all right, kudos. And I've just placed some images here and really, you know, it's, it might be a little bit grainy to see, but you know, how distinguished he looks as this gentleman. And then here is uh, him in the younger days. And this is watching that sleep study and probably on some rickety old bed, right? That did not offer a lot of comfort. Um, and then he himself participating as a sleep patient. Then we get to Dr. Dement, and um, Dr. Dement, he really is my generation, and, and so by virtue of that, yours too, if you've had the opportunity to go to some of the bigger sleep conferences where he participated, and it's a little bit of, you know, star worship, right? He was the guy that we grew up or, you know, learned about um, in sleep, and um, also, you know, again, in research, co-discovering REM sleep and establishing the first sleep disorders clinic in the 70s. And again, his contribution making sleep medicine an independently recognized field that we still fight today, but we've gotten a lot farther than we were then. And it really is through the work of these pioneers, I believe it. And here's him, and I just think, uh, you know, again, I think that's a precious picture. This was a, an award ceremony he got. But uh, have any of you worked on a piece of equipment like that? No show of hands? Okay. Me either. I did start in sleep on the Alice 3, which was a DOS system, you know, no, no camera, no microphones. We had baby monitors in the room, and when you heard the rustling of the patient, you run to the door and you peek in so that you can put the position that they're in, right? <laughs> trying, trying not to disturb them. But I did not have, I have seen these machines, you know, they're museum quality at this point. Uh, Dr. Colin Sullivan, so for you, for you respiratory folk, does this name kind of ring a bell to you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so this is the gentleman that developed CPAP, right, uh, with the, um, uh, I think it was a, a helmet, a reverse vacuum. He used a lot of spare parts, and, the, and somebody was talking about the engineers earlier. Yeah, that's what he did. He engineered that. And I will read just this little blurb. And again, this is he, you know, him in his younger days, and then as he matured and still working on those machines. In 1980, Colin Sullivan used a two-stage vacuum cleaner motor, individually molded masks, and the inside of a bicycle helmet to create the first device to deliver CPAP to patients with OSA. Prior to the invention of CPAP machine, sleep apnea was often treated with radical measures such as tracheostomy. Yeah, yeah. And even now, how many of you, even in the sleep lab, have had trach patients, right? You've had to do that. And that, the first one of those you get, it's terrifying. Oh my gosh, what am I supposed to do with that? Close it off? Oh my gosh. I don't want that responsibility. And then Dr. Mary Karskadon, and again, she really is the prominent figure with pediatric sleep. And, you know, as you know today, the pediatrics, it's becoming its own individualized specialty, and people have the opportunity to get credentialed with that, you know, being able to score that. Um, so that's very exciting, too. And, and she, there weren't a lot of photos. She must know somebody to not have her face plastered all over the Internet. Um, and again, you know, uh, examining the associations of sleep regulatory mechanisms to sleep-wake behavior of children, adolescents, and young adults. And her findings are what have raised public health issues regarding the consequences. And so for those of you, do any of y'all have um, students that have modified school times because the school district recognizes uh, the difference in sleep of the young people? Nah. It hasn't made it everywhere. Um, it hasn't made it everywhere, but it, it, you know, it might eventually. I'm not the authority on that. 
So here we are going to talk about just sleep tech responsibilities. And again, these are just different words to put into, I run sleep studies, I do sleep study acquisitions, I do polysomnograms. Um, and and we, we all know we are essential in the sleep field. Without us, there would be no sleep study data. We know this, without us and without the patients. Um, we are working directly with those patients and responsible for the crucial task, and we play a pivotal role in utilizing and advancing the technologies developed by sleep medicine pioneers, so those folks that we saw before, to ensure accurate diagnosis and effective treatment. And in many instances, and I know this from past experience, and, and another speaker kind of touched on this today, um, I, I have been in the situation where I acquired the study data, I study, I scored the study data, I generated the report and the recommendations, and the physician signed it and treated patients. So how smart are we? We know what's, we know what's going on. We are trained to operate and interpret data from various sleep monitoring devices. Again, um, all of the technology, we've come a long way from those uh, big grass machines and having to play with ink and paper and the messiness of that. Everything's getting far more streamlined. Um, the digital signals, again, when they were talking about EKG, you know, you're going to get a signal when you slap some patches on, but are you getting the right signal? You know, so we need to know those things. Um, we're recording those multiple physiological parameters and then and again, like I just said, we ensure that the collection of accurate and, uh, accurate and reliable data for diagnosis. Um, you know, I, I try to liken as I'm developing the Polysom program, uh, you know, we have a respiratory program, so they're going to have to learn that. We have uh, the EMTs who learn the cardiac arrhythmias, um, the telemetry folks, right? So sleep tech is a, is a very extensive telemetry process. We work to improve patient care. We're interacting closely with the patients throughout the diagnostic process. And again, another speaker mentioned, and I, I've always said this too, this is a very intimate environment that we're in. We have people coming in that don't want to, they don't want to be there. They're there because their bed partner made them show up. Um, maybe a doctor threatened that their life uh, span might be shortened if they don't show up. So we get them coming in cranky. Um, every once in a while, you'll get that really excited one, you know, every once in a great while, not very excited. Um, but as we're preparing them and explaining the procedures and ensuring their comfort. So as an accreditation specialist, yes, patient comfort is very important, but it is superseded by patient safety. And, um, you know, as we're teaching new techs, really understanding why we tether the equipment, why we tether the leads and we put them on in a certain fashion, in a certain order, it really is about that patient not stepping out of the bed to use the restroom and tripping over their own leg leads. And that becomes an incident, which becomes a compliance issue. And n nobody wants to deal with compliance issues. And then the technologist's vis uh, vigilance and ability to adapt to individual patient needs contribute to the overall quality of care. So I'm going to just kind of sit here for a minute thinking about those patient tech ratios. So, you know, it was always two to one, right? And we had protocols for special needs patients that we could make that a one to one. And then, and then for productivity and cost because reimbursements changed, that three to one thing came up, right? And we had to do it, right? We'll do what we have to do. We have to modify maybe what our process is, um, but it, it can be done. And, you know, do you have to sacrifice one for the other? You, you never know. Everybody has a night. But my contention is y you can have that patient chart, and it can be, they can look great on paper. <clears throat> <laughs> Throughout the course of the night, anything can go wrong and often does. And sometimes it does with all three patients, right? I'm just, I know I'm preaching to the choir. I love it. I love the affirmative head nods. But we adapt, adjust, and overcome, right? We make it happen. We take care. Um, having the resources available, you know, in the event that you need them, maybe first responders and things like that. Um, but this is what we do. I mean, we're watching a lot, and people who don't understand what polysomnography is thinking, oh, you just watch people sleep. Yeah, that, that's, yes, that's what I do. That's what I do.
We are analyzing the collected data to generate that comprehensive report. We know this. So again, these are not words that, unless you're updating your resume for some reason, you might not ever think in these terms. Um, the keen observation skills. I've been listening to y'all as you've interacted and responded with the speakers, and yes, I love it. I enjoyed the engaging about the scoring. Um, that's always interesting, and the changes of terminology for the same old thing. Uh, alpha waves are always alpha waves, right? That's not changing. And then making sure that, that um, accurate, the data is accurate. And somebody said something about the software, and I don't, I don't think she's sitting here. And I don't have my glasses on, so I can't really see y'all, which is a plus for me. Um, you can manipulate the report. D data can be manipulated. And um, I, you know that, that's one of those things, if you're asked to do it, whew, the ethics of that. And what is the intention behind that, right? Trying to get somebody qualified for something. Um, if it's a DOD worker, maybe trying not to qualify them for CPAP. I mean, I've seen all kinds of things. And those are the facilities, not facilities, generally it's, a, it's an IDTF maybe or, or a physician-based lab. Um, perhaps Medicare has become aware of that information and they are no longer in business. We're a team, right? No matter what sleep lab you go into, even if you're a, a tech all by yourself, maybe you have somebody that you report to that you can collaborate with. Um, and, and it tends to get better. I know our organization has a clinical support department, which I was like, oh, that's so fancy. That's not what I had growing up. Um, I'll tell you all this story. When I started in sleep, <laughs> on the Alice 3, on that DOS system. I, I trained one night, the, the person who trained me, I believe was not happy that I was there to also run sleep labs in that lab. And she was a three digit registry number, so of course, you know, hero worship. Uh, she, she told me to get a pen and paper, and she goes, copy down everything I say. And she did a 1020 setup. And then she sent me to the next room to go set that patient up. And it took me two hours, but I did it. Do y'all know that's when I fell in love with sleep and knew that's what I wanted to do. And here we are 20 years later. But I loved it immediately. I loved everything about it. Did I know what I was doing? No, I did not. I would run a study, didn't understand what a lead off looked like, what that artifact looked like. And I had great scorers, and one of them is a good friend of mine today. She would print out those epics, highlight stuff, and write, when you see this, this is what it is, do this to fix it. I still have those papers to this day. I show them to my students. That was valuable, but I was so appreciative to have somebody willing to teach me. Um, and then I went to the, uh, the, Atlantic, the Atlanta School of Sleep Medicine back in the day when it existed. I begged the doctor that I was running studies for to send me, and they did, and that eight days was really valuable. Um, one of the first purchases I bought, oh, I'm a nerd, I have the atlases the big black atlases. I still have those. Uh, I worked for a neurologist doing epilepsy monitoring. Uh, I had been his medical assistant before and he incorporated that and he gave me an original Rex Staffan and Kales scoring manual. Yeah, yeah, so I love it. Like I said, I'm a nerd. And then, you know, uh, the contributions and data interpretation. That dialogue that you have with your medical directors or your reading providers, anything that you can put in your summary is going to be valuable to them because you're the one that has had that relationship with that patient all night long. All night long. You see things, uh, even behavioral things that might not show up on the sleep study. And so, you know, your documentation is so key. And I really love a, a, a lush summary, right? Starting with patient is an X year old, you know, whatever gender and in going from there. I, I liked to mirror what the physician's H&P was. Um, so that, you know, it just had a professional feel to it. Um, we are patient educators. So every night with every patient, you are providing education. Not, you know, not just who you are and what they're going to experience that night, but we, we educate, or I believe we educate. And I believe, I believe our generation, or the generation of people sitting in this room, because I don't want to exclude anybody and I don't want to be an ageist, but I believe that everybody in this room definitely provides education to the patients. Um, something that I added to my nighttime spiel, once you get Grumpy McGruff settled down and he accepts that he has to be there with you, and you explain to them what's going to happen, Mr. Jones, now that you understand why you're here, what are your expectations for the night? 
right? And what's always interesting is when they finally concede, I just want to have a good night's sleep. It's something that simple. I just, I just want to have a good night's sleep. And again, they're probably not the ones that, uh, you know, the wives send them in their denial about their sleep. Um, and I also used to ask the patients who were grumpy about their bed partners sending them to the sleep lab because they snore. I'm like, do you think they're lying to you? Why would they lie? Why would somebody lie about snoring? Um, so yeah, I, I might get a little bit spicy with patients every once in a while. But the CCSH certification, so that was mentioned earlier. And I really appreciated hearing the dialogue, and I think the gentleman from the back, the questions that you asked um, about getting that incorporated into uh, you know, the facilities that might start acknowledging it. Um, I worked years ago and would go up to the floor. Uh, you know, We partnered well with our respiratory department and with the nursing department to be able to go up and just assess a patient and, and talk with them about their sleep, because up on the floor, they're dealing with multiple patients and a lot of bells and whistles, a lot of bells and whistles. So that O2 desaturation is just getting on their last good nerve. The temptation to turn it off is there, but let's address it. And so we were able to really partner. Um, so I'm, I'm just excited that this has become something that is getting validated. And you all know it takes a really long time for things to get validated and become the norm. It takes time. Um, having a business plan for it, right? Uh, getting up, you know, with the people in the industry, get into the forums and find out what, you know, the people who are practicing and the reimbursement is happening, how are they doing it? And there's plenty of webinars out there for that. I, I don't have the CCSH. I've actually been away from clinical for a, quite a while, quite a while. Um, but if I were still in that space, it, it would be something. I, I got the clinical sleep educator thing years ago when they had it. Um, and so it was a good start. So, you know, something. And this, sleep technologists bridge the gap between technology and patient care, ensuring that the advancements in sleep technology pioneered by individuals like Kleitman, Dement, Sullivan, and Karskadon translate into improved patient outcomes and a deeper understanding of sleep disorders. So that improved patient outcomes, we talk about that day in and day out um, in, in many different forms and fashions, looking at that compliance, having those CPAP clinics if you're able to. Um, the awake meetings, you know, that's just something that people got away from because they, you know, for some, they didn't want to be, it was an obligation outside of work hours, right? So that it was a volunteer type of um, opportunity that I think it, it aged out as well. All right, so as we look at what the technological advancements have been, I kind of started from the oldest to the newest in no particular order, but tried to keep it in order. You know, we have the CPAP, that, those HSATs, those home sleep tests that have invaded our, our livelihood. Um, they, there are facilities that this is all they do, right? It's their livelihood, so it's still an engagement. Um, and depending on where you are, the person who is conducting that education, if there is a human involved, um, we'd like to believe that they have some clinical experience, but it's, a, it's really just technical experience. The most important part comes in the reading of those. I am very interested in seeing how the, um, how the AASM addresses the scoring of those and, and what the change in viability is of those, if any. Uh, the wearable sleep tracking devices. Anybody wear one of those? Anybody use those? Yeah, yeah. Um, telemedicine, which, you know, uh, again, uh, happening before COVID, but becoming very prominent during COVID. Um, I am, I am as we speak, believe it or not, I am doing this concurrently with a virtual accreditation survey in my, in my uh, room. So telemedicine, doing things virtually. I have had telemedicine appointments myself. I love it. Unless I had something that, you know, internal I felt was going on, I can pretty much show you anything on the camera that you need. And I, and I like that interface. It doesn't bother me at all. Um, oral appliances. How many of you all have had the opportunity to run a study on a patient who came in wearing an oral appliance? Oh, more than I expected, and it's getting more prevalent. Um, and are you all, are you doing the adjustment? What is, your, what is your protocol for that? Is it your responsibility to do the adjustment, or has the patient been taught to do that adjustment? Yeah, yeah. And. Is there a specific policy in your organization about you going into a patient's mouth and touching that thing? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something to think about, right? It's just something to think about is what do you have a policy in place about the responsibility? And then uh, as far as competencies are concerned, what makes you, and I'm just picking on you because you volunteered, what makes you competent to adjust oral appliances? <laughs> that is key. That's essential. He said he is not confident or competent. Did I say that I correct that? Both ways. Um, and, and that's a problem, right? I know ideally the dentist who has provided the oral appliance to a patient, no matter what type it is, there should be some kind of an educational meeting to be held and documented that you attended and some kind of a check off list, maybe on a, on a dummy patient or, or something like that. Um, Something to just suggest, if you are touching an oral appliance and you have not been trained on it and all you got told was, well, you just do two clicks to the right or three clicks to the left, whatever it is, um, take, take that initiative and, and you know maybe set up something for the dentist to come do an in-service because are y'all accredited? Are your sleep labs accredited? I know for a fact you're supposed to have monthly education seminars, supposed to. And so what a great opportunity to maybe have a dentist or it could be the dental assistant, you know, whoever is qualified um, to develop a checklist for training because you're probably not going to get the rep for the company to be the one to do the training. Um, but with those dental offices that your sleep lab partners with, I strongly recommend just having a, set up an educational opportunity there. Implantable devices. So any of y'all fortunate enough to get to do anything with the Inspire? Yeah, yeah. Are they loving it? No? The tech doesn't love it? The tech doesn't love it? What tech, can you share why? Do you mind sharing why? While I take a drink of water. It's just, it's kind of scary to start with. Remember, remember when ASV was scary? There you go. Yes, ma'am. Ah, share that with me. Give me some more information about that because I'm just being nosy at this point. Do the, are you all, as far as follow-up, and I would love to have maybe one of the physicians to ask this question, are the physicians finding and follow-up with these Inspire patients that the patients, do they have any regrets about getting it, or do, do they believe, I've got this, I don't have to wear a mask, all is good in my world? We don't know. I would be interested in, in kind of reading that white paper, right, right, so the success. And so with the Inspire, are the techs still having to do, uh, you know, are they still titrating the are they're still still having to put them on and tight that's interesting okay well that'll be our secret we won't share that today all right uh, wakefulness drugs okay so um, I'm a fan I did nights for years uh, I never believed that I would be a day walker I am a day walker and it's a weird thing but not always without wakefulness medications um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that and then I've got AI down here at the bottom so, um, how many of you believe that AI is actively in your sleep labs as, as we sit here today? Okay, we're going to come back to that. All right, so, of course, I, I'm not going to say a lot about this. We have our original gold standard, and I, I didn't say the gold standard. I don't want anybody coming at me, but it was the, and is still the original gold standard. We know it's effective. We literally are the ones that get to put that gray pallid patient on CPAP in the middle of the night and see them pink up when they wake up in the morning. 
one of the most two satisfying things for me for the patient to say, oh, that is the best night of sleep I've had. Go figure. And then for their bed partner, generally a wife, to come in and say, oh my God, you're pink. And, and because they're aware of that gray pallor of, you know, the lack of oxygenation and all that good stuff. And so, yes, that's, that's one of the most gratifying parts of the job. That, and, and I think we were talking about patient satisfaction earlier as well. And this one kind of hurt my heart a little bit, but in a very sweet and sensitive way, when patients would thank you for being so nice to them. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh. We are the, yes, thank you for being so nice to me. And I'm like, who's not being nice to you in healthcare? I demand to know who they are, right? All right, so we've got our gold standard there. Um, all right, so you know, this home sleep apnea testing came along, threatened our very existence, scared us. Um, and you know, this, it became more widely recognized in the 90s and the early 2000s. But it doesn't feel like we got hit quite that early with it, right? This is one that was introduced. Um, and it has emerged, facts are facts, as a convenient and cost-effective alternative to in-lab polysomnography for diagnosing sleep apnea. That's why I'm not on camera in case I make faces. Say again. Well, look, it's the less they have to pay, the happier they are. It's well, this is where the lobbyists come in, right? Are you a lobbying kind of gal? Maybe, right? And the at-home wireless uh, sleep monitoring patches. I just added this one because, you know, uh, my organization we do a lot of research for the wearables. Um, and uh, so I've gotten to play with, you know, the, the, the ring and the watch pad and the night owl and the Balin ring, you know, all kinds of things, um, just, just to do, you know, comparative assessments. But I enjoyed this one because it's strictly just patches that fit on the body. You're not fighting wires because I didn't even like the watch pad. Uh, and I used to, I used to be, that's not me. I used to be doubtful of the patients that would say, oh, the thing is too tight, it burned my finger. I, I will just go ahead and admit out loud I wore that watch pad. And the pulse ox is really nice and cushiony. Like when you put your finger in, it's all cushiony and you feel, oh, so secure. Whew, took that thing off in the morning and I had dents and, and redness in my finger. So I, I'm like, I was not as empathetic to patients who made those complaints and shame on me, shame on me. Um, the wearable sleep tracking devices. So uh, again, you know, most of us who have the watches, the Apple watches or the Fitbits, um, I use mine more for a fitness trainer than a, a fitness tracker than sleep because I'm a good sleeper. Having been a night person who transitioned into a, a day walker, uh, I'm very selfish about my sleep and it took me many years to, to accept that it was okay for me to be selfish. Um, but they've been, you know, since the mid uh, 2010s. Uh, they're the smart watches, fitness tra trackers, they're monitoring your sleep duration, sleep stages, heart rate, and movement. And I'm a little, I'm a little doubtful. I, I, you know, I think I just don't feel like they really are tracking uh, based on my own perception of my own sleep. Um, but there are, they are making such advances in that and they're so much more sensitive and, um, you know, they're constantly working on those algorithms. And they offer a user-friendly approach to understanding sleep quality can encourage individuals to adopt healthier sleep habits and um, you know it gives you some insight to your sleep now have you all ever done any of the wearable just sleep monitoring is anybody and if you don't want to say it's okay um, but if you do do you find that you feel it's accurate to your sleep or do you look at it and say mm -mm, that's I don't believe it yeah yeah go ahead Mm-hmm, yeah. So, but they're out there, and I think right now, um, any anything we can do to get people to be aware of their, not just their wakefulness, being tired all day, but their sleep, and reconditioning themselves. And I'll tell you, you know, they say it takes, what, 21 days to make a habit. Trying to get somebody who has just been lawless about their sleep, I'm married to one of those people, lawless about his sleep. Uh, he is just now being more consistent and deliberate about his sleep. But I'm like, I've, you've known me the entire time I've been in sleep. How do you not believe me? I'm offended. 
but I'm wearing them down. All right, so just a few fun pictures. So this Fitbit, this was founded in 2007, and this is really where, you know, the popularization of wearing the fitness and sleep trackers began. Um, and you've got those Fitbit Flex, Fitbit Charge. They're so neat, right? They come in very sleek uh, um, uh, um, packages. Uh, the face of them doesn't look like a face watch. It really just looks like a piece of jewelry. And, and that, I'm a girl, it sold me. Um, the jawbone. Does anybody remember the jawbone? Now, I only remember the jawbone as the Bluetooth uh, accessory because I'm married to a, a tech nerd who has tried all of the Bluetooth. And so I did have the jawbone, and they have that, I think it's a proprietary or copyrighted uh, diamond type pattern. But this was another one, and again, it looks like a nice piece of jewelry coming out about um, 2011. And then, of course, we have our Apple Watches. I, I, I didn't mean to be biased. I did not put anything uh, Android up here. I apologize. But the Apple, the Apple again, say, shame on me. I'm sorry. I apologize publicly because remember, we've got people online listening to this too. Um, but yeah, and so being able to see, you know, even a, like a hypnogram for anybody that's going to understand that and get your data. And again, I always uh, am interested in how true it is, but I, I don't like to wear the watch to bed, so it's not tracking my data. And I'm sorry, I'm trying not to provide any feedback. I just, you see it was good for them to give me something to hold in my hands. All right, so then telemedicine, we started incorporating that. And again, this really started um, before the pandemic, but became really a, a lifeline during the pandemic. Um, telemedicine really gained popularity probably out in, in the Midwest where we're rural, so rural, right? Don't have access to care right at our doorstep. You know, it takes hours to get to your doctor's office and I I discovered so when I was a surveyor <laughs> y'all I have been to some places I've been to some places that I would walk in the door and they would know I was you're not from here mainly because it would be January and I was not in enough layers because I'm from North Carolina and we don't do this kind of cold uh, but I, I would ask them I, I'm like I I went through seven counties and nothing but fields to get to you and then all of a sudden there's this little oasis of a uh, hospital and some doctor's offices and maybe some a school I'm like where do y'all get your groceries right that's what I wanted to know that was my big question and when you're out in the farm hinterlands they're growing their own groceries right 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 all right so um, and again this allowed the remote patient consultations can be monitored and those follow-ups uh, they can you know it gives the patient the opportunity and again if they have that technical savvy and we kind of understand that um, the generation above us does not always have the technical aptitude. I know my own mother would not swipe on anything. She uses a Kindle and that's it. That's it, that's all she's willing to use. And now she's on the YouTube and a conspiracy theorist. But it really gives, it does give those patients access to that care. Um, if they can do the video, there is still that face-to-face -face that you know they might desire. Y'all know people, when they get to a certain age, Doctor visits are their social activity. They look forward to it. And don't you cancel. Don't you cancel on me. I made a plan for the day. And so this becomes their social interaction. And I think that telemedicine kind of maintaining that is, is very critical to that. And perhaps it brings a level of comfort to the patient. They don't have to physically leave anywhere. And maybe they'll be a little bit more uh, candid and open about what they're experiencing. Um, and again, the telemedicine, again, you know, it's just distance, reviewing sleep study data. And so again, for those of you who are fortunate to maybe have a clinical support or the opportunity to, to remote in. If you have that, that tech who's freaking out in the middle of the night because they're seeing something they've never seen before, teleport in and look at it and calm them down, give them advice, and just knowing that you're available makes the difference. So, all right. And then these oral appliances. So, again, this is a non-invasive treatment. Um, I feel it's invasive. I've tried to wear mouth guards just for teeth grinding. And, uh, it's invasive. I don't like it. But it involves wearing those custom-made oral appliances, so it's designed specifically for the patient's mouth, and much like a mouth guard, and um, you know it, it repositions. You all know what these are. And so when we were talking about the clicks, when these patients are having their studies, and you're you're making adjustments to that oral appliance. Um, you know, how many clicks does it take to advance that jaw to keep that airway open and how effective is it? Uh, but again, people are willing to do anything but wear that little mask on their face, right? They'll, they'll just, it's desperation. 
uh, effective for mild to moderate OSA. And so, you know, we, we mentioned the parameters changing for, um, what was it, the, say again? Inspire. The Inspire, thank you. Um, I, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how this changes. And again, you know, looking at the white papers, how effective are these for anybody that's above that, even in that moderate, that moderate zone, right? I would be curious about that. And again, they're, they're custom fitted. Um, it, again, I, I just, I, I was a CPAP user and I loved my CPAP and I was faithful to it and I love my nasal pillows and, you know, you can go in and make your own adjustments and, you know, all that good stuff when you, when you have a certain, a certain set of skills. Um, but yeah, so the oral appliances, they're still out there. Um, over the years, the reimbursement has improved for those. It's not wonderful. Do, what, do you find any experience in that with uh, doing any of the billing or anything? Are you involved in that? No. Um, but it has gotten better. There was a time where that was strictly an out-of-pocket uh, and some insurances. Again, whatever's least expensive is what's going to be desirable for an insurance company. And, you know, it's not necessarily less expensive for a patient. <sighs> These surgical interventions. So, again, how desperate do you have to be to not wear a CPAP? Desperate, I say. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. All right, so we have that U triple P. It was one of the most common surgical procedures, uh, removing that excess tissue from the throat uh, and done in the back of the mouth and throat. And again, I saw many patients, especially ENT referred patients that were coming back to the sleep lab because it was not effective. And you can only remove so much tissue. All right, the uh, genioglossus advancement, another surgical procedure that repositions the tongue attachment to the lower jaw. Whew. I was a surgical tech years ago in the Air Force, and there are just certain, oh, thank you. There are certain procedures that um, I, like I couldn't do anything orthopedic. My, everything we operated on hurt, and I was, you know, 19. And so the idea, it's bad enough getting a wisdom tooth pulled, right? So the idea of them repositioning how your tongue attaches, I know, right? I, it's a little cringy. And it aims to enlarge the upper airway. Again, desperation, I say. The maxo, maxillomandibular advancement, uh, you see the first two words there, more complex. A more complex surgical procedure that repositions both the upper and lower jaw. Oh, my goodness. And recommended for the severe sleep apnea cases and can be quite effective in improving airflow. Now, I've only ever had sleep patients come to the sleep lab who had the U triple P. I haven't had the opportunity to see what the rest of these are, but I, I'm, these are probably so far back in the list of options at this point. Um, but these were just, just some examples for you that, I, you know, I, I didn't know about that last one. Never heard of it. Uh, no, 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 the, the, um, the second to last one. The hyoid suspension. Okay. Repositioned and anchored to the front of the spine and stabilizes the airway and prevent it from collapsing during sleep. I'm going to have a dark moment with you. The only thing I ever hear about the hyoid bone is on crime shows, and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I know it's dark and not appropriate. I'm sorry if I offended anybody. Nasal surgery, <sighs> several of these types of patients as well, right? The deviated septum, the turbinate. So I believe Dr. Manicrati said something about the, the prolapsing turbinates in the nose, and that's so severe. And it is interesting. I, I, know every, I know every doctor I go to looks in my nose and my ears. So the fact that that got missed is a little, little uh, unsettling. And then here we come back to that tracheostomy. Right, highly invasive. Again, we've got more complex, highly invasive, um, creating an opening in the trach using the tube. Uh, it's just a lot. And again, I, I think um, it, it's, it does say reserved for severe life-threatening cases of sleep apnea. I, I would imagine this would happen maybe if somebody's in critical care, right? If they've come to the ER, there's a critical care situation. Uh, but, but I would like to believe that would be a temporary fix until they could stabilize the patient. Maybe the patient, you know, is able to make healthcare decisions. Um, so that, you know, is pretty drastic too. But again, it, you know, for any of you, especially that have worked in hospital-based sleep labs, you, you could see anything come in the sleep lab, and, and we have, right? 
the hypoglossal nerve stimulation. So this is where we talk about the Inspire, and we've kind of already touched on that. So this is the newest and, and the neatest thing that's out there, um, and it is the only one that's approved by the FDA at this time. So there's plenty of other um, companies that are also working on this. And again, it becomes just a proprietary type of item, and it's really about how can I do it just differently enough to make it unique, and we can make it our own, and we can get it approved. Uh, again, suitable for moderate to severe that have not responded to other treatments. And, you know, I just personally appreciate hearing that there are still challenges with that. Uh, you know, the, again, the worst thing that happens with CPAP is trying to find that right mask, right, that magic mask that's going to give the patient peace and a good night. Our wakefulness medications. Yay! All right, so the pharmaceutical agents, and, and again, uh, you know, you've been on, you, you've heard, remember the new Vigil, the ProVigil, it's been through a couple of iterations. Um, they're, they're dealing with different mechanisms of actions. Uh, it, these are designed to promote alertness, increase that wakefulness. Um, the mechanism, they're affecting specific neurotransmitters, and they are prescription-based, and really, um, they are a valuable tool what I read in this is people using them properly is the challenge, right? Using them properly, it's a prescription. And paying attention to the education that you should be receiving about understanding maybe your circadian rhythm and what your sleep habits are. Because I will tell you, taking a wakefulness drug when you are tired after having maybe worked all night, no matter what your job is, um, it, it, it really um, impacts the efficacy of what the drug is intended. If your brain isn't right when you take the medication, it's not going to respond right. And again, the modafinil, armodafinil, methylphenidate, um, enhancing the alertness, again, for narcolepsy, right? So very specific. Uh, and you'll have some providers, you know, that um, for some of those, they tell you just to take them when uh, you're not on, sh uh, or when you're on shift and then don't take them. Again, just some more non-stimulant, the wake promoting. At, so it's at 47, what does that mean to me? Oh, Joe's checked out. Okay, wrapping up. Um, the artificial intelligence, so again, uh, revolutionizing the field of sleep technology. Again, the monitoring, we're using it, it's there. We're using it in our, um, in our equipment that we're wearing. It's assisting healthcare. We have the scoring that's be done, being done. Anything that has algorithm attached to it, there's gonna be some AI. Um, the humble beginnings uh, began in sleep technology years ago, and um, one notable early development was the introduction of computerized sleep studies and polysomnography in the 1960s, which laid the foundation for using data analysis techniques in sleep medicine. And in the 21st century, its role has expanded significantly with the development of those diagnostic tools, the sleep tracking, uh, tracking apps and devices helping with uh, detection and diagnosis, sleep monitoring and tracking, um, treatment optimization. And again, we start back with some sleep, sl smart sleep devices. Mattresses even are using AI, right? Mattresses. All right, where it can control lighting, temperature, things like that. Uh, again, this is just more on the mattresses. And it is used to analyze large data sets. So again, you know, if you're using any of the auto scoring um, software, it's data collection. It's doing a different type of data collection. Monitoring in healthcare settings. Again, the healthcare facilities, uh, monitoring the patients with the uh, with AI. And again, it's just in our everyday life. AI actually was uh, first coined somewhere in the 1950s, believe it or not. It's just learning that's done by something not human or animal. Sleep technologists, the polysom, the, uh, polysom education. So again, this one really is my happy slide because uh, you know I've already told you I enjoyed teaching. I enjoyed teaching new techs. I enjoyed being a preceptor when we would have students coming in on rotation. Um, and there is a desperate need for sleep techs across the nation. Um, and so you know, for those who are interested, especially as a certain generation is maybe tired of working nights or is looking to continue working, um, consider your local or near local community colleges and what they offer is there if there's an opportunity to add on to a respiratory um, program you know be an adjunct and uh, 
instructor. Um, this one, I reached out to our local college. I said, hey, do y'all ever intend to start a polysomnography program? It had just so happened that month the hospital had said, y'all really need to have one. And again, this is the third largest community college in North Carolina. And I, the day that I called, she's like, your timing is perfect. And so I will start that in January as the program chair, very excited. But let's get them into research, right? If you have an opportunity, especially if you have vendors, you know, is there opportunity for our facility to participate in research? The wearables, we're doing research that the patient um, just has to sign the consent. They're listening to the ambient of the room to determine the apnea and if it matches the study. We have another one, they're doing a depression scale for patients. So get in, into research and just, just ask the vendors, call the companies. Um, again, the techs are getting, uh, you know, there's more, uh, there is more opportunity for the techs to uh, get engaged in some of this newer technology. Um, so making sure that they're doing that. And uh, just understanding we are constantly evolving and improving. The transformations are coming. Some of us are, are maybe not going to see some of the greatest, uh, but it would be exciting to get the newer generation of sleep techs out of a, a plug and play mentality, maybe, if that's there, if anybody's experiencing that. And uh, getting involved, volunteering, right? Being on when you see those ads for the board needs volunteers, be brave. I would love to volunteer for this. And so that's it. I'm just going to conclude right there. And so does anybody have any questions, comments, or contributions? You all have really been great. I appreciate your engagement and sharing your experiences. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is my personal goal. So the town, I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina, and we have the military base there. And I am personally working on getting uh, the military folks to engage with this program, the spouses, the dependents, people who are willing to travel and go be elsewhere. Um, the travel companies for sleep tech, they do, I don't think they do as much as they used to, but getting people to understand you don't need to stay where you are. You're in competition with 20 other people in this class. Diversify, right? Getting those ads out. Where in West Tennessee are you? In I'm from Union City. Oh, One of my very best friends lives in Jackson. Okay, well, there you go. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is a mixed bag, but we've been here today and we hear people say, we need tax, we need tax, we need tax. And it's getting tax to where the need is. And also having them understand, you know, looking at that published data about expectations for salary, teaching tax. I will tell you, my students will understand what insurance reimbursement is and why you might get paid X amount here, you might get paid X amount here, there's shift if here. I, I know, you know, my organization, they, um, Medbridge, they have incentivization for the techs that do the extra work for research, which is sometimes just paperwork, y'all, that's all it is. Or they'll run that extra patient, or, oh, here's the one that has given me palpitations. We'll pay you to score your studies. So I, I, I was not aware that techs weren't scoring their studies on the fly so they could determine if they needed to split a patient or not. <coughs> so, uh, you know, it, it's things that can be negotiated, and I think probably will. Whew, anybody else? Thank you all so much. I appreciate this. Excited to be here. Thank you.